making sure your initial pricing doesn't damage your brand and addresses more than one market segment. I think that's the most common mistake I see with small businesses. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the transcendent relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Zen Orr. Here are three things you want to know about Zen before we start. He spent a year studying at the Wine Academy. I think I took the home study course. Uh, he's been a management consultant in the hospitality industry for many years, and he now has the title of that pricing guy at pricing is a thing. Welcome, Zen. That's it. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me in the show. Uh, this is just going to be fun. I got to yeah. say, while I was preparing for a call, I got more and more excited to talk to you because your name, Zen, your company name, pricing is a thing, your title, that pricing guy, you have a pro bono <laughs> tab on your webpage. Yes. You're passionate about <laughs> Jewish Buddhist pricing as a service. I have no idea where this conversation is going to go, but oh, let's start with how did you get into pricing? Fantastic. Uh, yeah, that might be a good ease into it. So um, I actually got into pricing um, working in the hospitality and wine industry. And I noticed that well, at first I thought everybody buys just according to price, not it makes sense. If it's cheap, they might buy more of it. If it's expensive, they buy less. And especially if you work in, you know, silver, di silver dining or chef restaurants, you realize that that's not the case. Some people buy the wine, some people buy the label, some people buy the price. They just want to, you know, you, they want to get that champagne on the table, even if they don't like it. And um, I think one day when I worked at a wine shop and my boss was a very respectable uh, wine consultant back in Israel, he had a, a, a winery uh, calling him and they had a very, very difficult problem. And he charged them a pretty penny for that to solve their problem. And he solved it with a phone call. And I said, well, how come you charge so much? for a phone call. I said, well, it's not how much time I invest in it now. It's the value I provide. And I was very young to hear that. And I think it switched something in my head. Yeah. So it's, it's always an event like that that just says to us, oh my gosh, it's about, it's about value, right? It's about what am I delivering to somebody and what are they getting from it? So, I mean, that's a, that's a fabulous story. So, yeah, so tell me, I actually wasn't planning on asking this, but I'm going to ask it. Tell me about wine pricing, because that seems to me to be the one product where the words price as a signal of quality is, is like dominant. There's, I can't think of another product where price is a, is a more strong indicator of the quality and what, how people buy. Yes, exactly. Cause um, I do have spirits come to mind. So Whiskey would be a very good example, but with whiskey, you would usually, usually, uh, you would strive for consistency. So if you buy your favorite brand, you expect to get roughly the same kind of experience. With wine, it changes every year. Different vintage, different climate. And you see a label, you might get your favorite wine critic, and that's about it. You didn't, most of the times, you didn't, you didn't taste the wine. And label presentation and price that's basically what you base your purchase decision on obviously there's a lot of costing involved because that's a factory making wine is a factory uh, but the way pricing works i think even without calling it by that name it's more psychological than one might think yeah i could i could absolutely buy that so Okay. So now what I did prepare, the question I really wanted to ask is where did pricing is a thing come from? <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, you can say I'm a pricing analyst gone rogue. I used to be a pricing analyst for a petrol company. 
uh, back in Perth and then Australia. And then I worked for a couple of corporations here in Sydney. And I realized that I want to help the small businesses. And immediately as I started having the conversations with small business owners, I realized that that's the main message. They don't understand that pricing is a thing. It's not something you do at the end, occasionally five minutes before you launch into market. It's something you have to think about way before you even start designing your service or product. And everybody is aware of tax. Everybody is aware of marketing. Everybody is aware of social media. And they don't know that pricing is a thing. So I decided to be the carrier of that so important message. You know, I never thought of that before, but that's absolutely true. How many times has someone asked me what I do? I say I'm a pricing expert. And the next words out of their mouth are, what's that? (laughs) (laughs) So you work five minutes a day? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, um, so tell me about petrol pricing or in the US here, we would call it gas or gasoline. And, uh, and you were talking about independent gas stations, right? Independent petrol stations. Yes. So just tell me what you want to tell me. And then if you haven't answered my questions, I'll ask you specific questions about this (laughs) because that, that business fascinates me. Uh, Cool. So I started working as an operations manager in a petrol company company. Um, and as operations manager, basically you're in charge of three things. Um, Make sure we don't run out of petrol. Uh, So procurement. Make sure we charge the right price. So we don't want to be very expensive. That's one of the brand values. We want to be relatively, let's say, first, second, maybe third cheapest in every geographical micro segment because that's where the volume is. And then, uh, um, so that's so procurement, pricing, and third bit uh, would be make sure that everything works. So liaising with trade is uh, pump faults and everything like that. And I started working there exactly following this directive. Make sure nothing bad happens and we're happy. And I come from a statistics background. So after a couple of months, I said, you know what? We can actually do that way better because with cost price and cost price for petrol changes every day. You get an email 6 a.m. So we can actually try and build a forecast model around cost. And it doesn't have to be an amazing forecast model because the average lifespan of a fuel tank in a service station is four days. So you only have to get a better than 50-50 chance guess in a span of four days. That's for a statistician, that's not a big ask. So we started working around that and doing some statistical modeling uh, around petrol prices as cost. And then I said, you know what? With sell price, sell price, we don't necessarily have to just look at our competitions in every geographical micro segment in order to set the price. We can actually look at other stuff, other stuff because, um, well, the way we call it is hypothesis, hypothesis and test customer value drivers beyond price. So what makes you buy other than what's the cheapest nearby? Let, let's go there. And we, really, we realize that actually there's so many metrics that influence your willingness to pay for petrol, for petrol in this uh, area. And some people will just go because they like the service. You remember their name. Some people have their, uh, their favorite newspaper or if they can buy a good and healthy breakfast on the way to work, they'll go and, and, and fill up at your place, even though you're a bit more expensive. So we started testing that in market and we started playing with the metrics and we realized that yes, sometimes you can raise the price as long as, long as you raise another metric or another value driver, they will keep buying and you will maintain the same volume with the higher price. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's the business you want to have. Nice. So my rule is right-hand turns into gas stations. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what side of the road do you drive in the States? Because the, uh, right. It's diff- the oh, right-hand okay. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay. So now the thing, that, uh, the thing that always fascinates me about gas station pricing is 
the way it tracks the price of oil. Yes. So if the price of oil goes up today, the price of gas goes up today. Yes. Even though it takes <laughs> eight to 10 weeks for a drop of oil to come out of the ground and make it to that gas station. <laughs> yes. So now, can you explain why that happens? Uh, I can explain my best guess because okay. my best uh, guess because I'm not, uh, you know, we, as, a, as a service station company, we are basically retailers, so we don't produce gas. Um, but I think it's just way easier to immediately follow the trend in cost rather than go into deep analysis of volume tracking and that sort of stuff. So we just say, you know what? What's in the tanks is in the tanks. What's in the gantry is in the gantry. From now on, it's like when you open a restaurant, it's what you put on the shelves, that's it. You never see that money again. And then if they raise the price for whiskey, you raise the, the price for whiskey. You don't think about how many milliliters in the bottle when you bought it. So you, you price according to market cost. And then um, most, most um, gas companies will usually follow the same cost plus margin formula with a tweak up and down a couple of cents. And it's the independent ones that cause all the trouble because they, they do that differently. Nice. So, so I think what you said is pretty consistent with what I've always taught. And that is, if the price of oil goes up, it's a signal to everybody, hey, you can raise prices because everybody else is going to raise prices. So let's all raise prices together. Even though there's no real collusion, nobody calls anybody and says, are you going to raise prices today? It's just, hey, let's go raise prices. Now, exactly, because you're not allowed to communicate. So you're not right. allowed to have that chat. But something that I'd never thought about before is whoever you bought the gas from, so they raised their prices too yes. when the price of oil went up. Yes, and actually, and that, that's a trade secret, secret I can share. Um, actually, we make better margin when the cost is high because then we know everybody's going to raise the price. When the cost is low, everybody lowers their price, but they also lower the margin because they want to maintain volume. So actually yeah. when the prices is high, um, that's not where you're most competitive, but yeah. Yeah, I, I would actually argue that it's probably when the price of oil is going up, you make a lot of margin. And when the price of oil is going down, you make, um, or when the price of oil is stable, I'll put it that way. Yeah. That's when you make less margin because now all the gas stations are, are pricing competitively. They're trying to steal share and we've got this consistent floor cost that's, that's hurting us. Yes. So. It's like all the kids in the kindergarten, they got nothing better to do. So they start fighting. And actually that's a very big uh, issue with tactical pricing uh, with service stations is how to get out of a price war. Because sometimes you lock on with a competitor and it's a race to the bottom from there. And there's a lot to learn about how you get out of a price war without, you're not allowed to talk to them. So how do you right. signal you want to go up? Right, right. Nice, nice. Um, next topic I wanted to bring up with you just because I found this fascinating is I have never seen a pro bono tab on a pricing company's website. <laughs> So tell me how you put it up there and how I could get you to give me free pricing services. So um, I'm a Jubu, which means I'm a Jewish Buddhist. So I come from Jewish heritage. I practice some Juda Judaism practices and I practice some Buddhist practices. I mainly meditate, but a bit more than that. And both systems of thought um, propagate or call for giving, expecting nothing in return. It's a way of saying, if you want to feel good about life in general, if you want to just be happy, one of the mental tools you can use is practice that, giving, expecting nothing in return. And it doesn't have to be something very big. You can just give a donation to somebody on the street. It doesn't matter what. Just do an act of kindness, a, a random act of kindness, and 
and you see how you feel. And when I started my business, and I think um, this is all consultants see this too many times, the businesses that need us the most can't afford it. And, and it tore me apart because I, I can help you. I can help you make more money, but you can't afford my services and I see you backing away. And I decided I wanted, I'd never want to experience that again. So if you're a solopreneur or you're a fundraiser or a charity, then I can either say, you know what, this is pro bono, especially if you're a fundraiser or a charity, I'll do this pro bono. I just want you to raise money for your costs. And usually with these kind of organizations, there's not a lot of analytics involved. It's basically tactics, maybe a bit of strategy, and a lot of price presentation. And with solopreneurs, I do that a bit differently. So if you're a one-man show or one-woman show, you can't afford that now, your, your cash flow is basically non-existent, then, okay, I'll tell you what, you pay what you can. So you pay what you think is right. It's, and again, it's, it's me showing that I believe in what I do and I believe in what I understand about how people pay. So I'm happy to give you my services. Again, it doesn't involve much analytics at this stage. Um, and all you have to do is pay two times. One time at the end of the consultation. So once we have a price setting, and the second time is three months after that. That's all you have to do. You, you can pay as much as you want, and I'm not gonna criticize you for this. And experience shows that's actually not a bad uh, financial decision on my end as well. Yeah, I like that. I like the fact that you figured out a way to do pay as you want or pay what you want or pay what you can or however you want to phrase that yeah. in the pricing world. I think that's pretty cool. Or in, you could even call that the consulting world, right? This is consulting yes. in that perspective. Yeah. So I have a, a very similar philosophy. I love helping the entrepreneurs around my local Reno area. Uh, and so oftentimes they ask, well, how much do you charge? And my answer is always, I'm very expensive or I'm free. <laughs> right? <laughs> And I have to say something on this note. I actually took a couple of your courses online because um, when I started to work as a corporate pricing analyst, the first thing that people look for is certificates. What's your certificate in pricing? So I was listening to your podcast then and I said, you know what? I need to try Mark's uh, online courses. And they're amazing. They're amazing courses and they bring a lot of value even to pricing professionals uh, in just getting to better understand the deeper concepts uh, of pricing. And I texted you on LinkedIn, I think it was two years ago. And I said, hi, Mark, I want to do the subscription. Um, I couldn't find the link. <laughs> I think I was very tired. And you said, yes, then it's $100 a month. But uh, if you press this link over there, which you didn't look at before, you can actually get the first month for five dollars. So you actually willingly forfeited ninety-five dollars just to make sure that this guy is happy. And and I'll never forget that. Well, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't think we have that special going. But now that you said that, if you want it, email me. I'll see what I can do. Uh, I'll give you the I'll give you the link at the end. But thank you very much. That was really nice of you to say that. I appreciate thank it. You. Well, one you. of the things that I find interesting about pricing professionals is uh, there, there are pricing consultants and pricing consultants get exposed to lots of different businesses and industries. And, and so you start taking these theoretical concepts and figuring out how do they apply in all these different situations. A lot of times pricing professionals are in one company, in one industry. And so you start to think that's what pricing is. And, and that is what pricing is in that industry but it takes looking around and looking at other industries and other situations and, and figure out how do these concepts apply to all these places. And I think that's what I help pricing people do in these courses is it isn't just about your industry. These are the concepts and how they apply in different situations. So definitely. Cause as a chess player, I can say that once you play chess and you kind of get used to that strategic thinking, let's think not just what I want to do now or in, two minutes, 
What do I want to do in four, five, six, seven steps? What do I want to do if that happens? What do I want to do if that happens? So once you get accustomed to that kind of strategic thinking, it's in your mental toolbox. And I think it's the same with your courses. So it doesn't matter if you're pricing petrol or you're pricing uh, read, um, uh, fast moving consuming goods or anything, you understand the mental toolkit for pricing. And I think that's priceless. Oh, thank you. Uh, so how much do I owe you for this ad, Zen? I'll just send you an invoice. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> or you can pay as much as you think is there. Uh, yeah, right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're, we're gonna run out of time here, but let me end with the final question. Yes. What's one piece of pricing advice that you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Um, well, we didn't discuss segmentation much, but I think that making sure your initial pricing doesn't damage your brand and addresses more than one market segment, I think that's the most common mistake I see with small businesses. So not all customers value your product or service the same way. Make sure you address all of them. All right. So I think um, I often say segmentation is the second most profitable thing you can do in pricing. So uh, the most, the first is obviously adopting value-based pricing instead of cost plus pricing. Definitely. So, but, uh, but absolutely. I think that's great. Zen, that was uh, fabulous. Um, thank you for your time. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, the best way to contact me is either via LinkedIn, Zenor, Z-E-N-O-R-E, or through my website, pricingisathing.com. Um, if you also want the option to join my meetup groups, just go to meetup.com and search for 499 Pricing Discussion Group. And that's a free discussion group for people to join and share their pricing challenges. All right. And we'll have a, a link to your LinkedIn page or something on our show notes. So they'll be able to reach out and find you. So that'll be great. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Episode 108 is all done. Uh, please take a moment to leave us a review on whatever platform you use, Apple, um, Stitcher, Podchaser. There's many of them. And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or about pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.